lives in North Andover, runs a barbershop there. Um, but the reason why we brought him here today is he was actually a um, presenter last year during senior seminars. And I think his message is really important for everyone to hear. Um, and what he's going to focus on today really um, is decision making. That's something that everybody needs to probably focus on. But more specifically, um, think about the really big impact that small decisions can make over the course of time. So without any further ado, Anthony, it's now your turn to uh, go right ahead. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. This is, it's always a huge honor to be asked to speak somewhere. Um, and to do it like this during this time is pretty cool. Um, and to the kids listening, uh, we're also filming this. There's a camera behind there. Uh, for other schools that might want to um, show it to their students in the future, at least we'll have it on tape. So you guys um, allowing us to do that is amazing. Um, so again, my name's Anthony. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today, um, just like he said, about choices. Um, and the reason I'm here is because I used to be a heroin addict. And heroin addiction was my result of my bad choices. Um, and it wasn't like one bad choice that led to it. It was just a series of small choices that led me down a path that led to heroin addiction. So if you're listening and, and you think heroin addiction is completely out of your realm and would never happen, take the heroin addiction out of it and just think of it in terms of choices. Decisions that you make on a daily basis that may be right or wrong that lead you down certain paths. Um, so for me, um, I'll tell you a little bit about how it happened, uh, I'll tell you what I did about it, and I'll tell you how I live my life today um, in recovery um, and obviously not using heroin anymore. So um, I grew up in North Andover, uh, I still live in North Andover, and like he was just saying, I, I have a barber shop in North Andover now. But um, I grew up in what I think is a really good town. And I grew up in what I think was a really good family. Um, you know, I didn't grow up wanting for anything. I had a really good childhood. We went to Disney World so many times I can't count. I had family dinner every night with my parents and my two younger sisters. Um, my family life was amazing. Um, my childhood was amazing. Um, it wasn't anything like where there were warning signs when I was younger. So um, I grew up, had a great childhood, all that. Got into high school, I played sports my whole life. Um, my main sport was hockey. So my freshman year in high school, I was on the varsity hockey team. And um, that's when I started to have feelings that were different from when like, I was a kid. So I'll give you guys an example. Like, um, and this is just to quickly go through my life in high school, and I'm not gonna like harp on it too much, but um, freshman year in high school, being on the varsity hockey team was the first time in my life that I was ever around older kids. Um, the first time in my life that I've ever, you know, had kids like that to look up to. I was always the oldest in my family. I was always the oldest cousin of all my cousins, so I kind of was always the oldest. Being a freshman in the same locker room as seniors was a really big deal for me. Um, I started to get feelings of like, am I fitting in? Feelings of anxiety, like am I dressing the right way? Am I saying the right thing? Like, I was like always nervous about it. And I think I probably thought about it too much. Um, and I think that's part of what peer pressure is. Peer pressure doesn't have to be like somebody pressuring you. I think it's pressure you put on yourself as well. So freshman year, um, I'll tell you guys, I never went out. Um, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke weed. Um, just to give you an idea of like how good of a kid I was freshman year, um, I had never said a swear in my life, um, including freshman year in high school, um, never. I even got uncomfortable in the locker room when other kids were swearing. Um, so I think that gives an idea a little bit about how I was. So if somebody freshman year in high school had said, hey, someday you're gonna become a heroin addict, it just wouldn't even have been, I wouldn't even have known really what heroin was or, or I had never even known anyone that used it. Um, so sophomore year in high school, um, to give you another little idea about, about how it led up to it. Um, I was still a really good kid. 
playing sports, um, doing well in school, and not swearing, and not drinking, and not smoking weed, and just being what I thought was a really good kid. Um, I can remember during the hockey season, sophomore year in high school, the first time I ever swore. And I remember there was this big conversation going on inside the locker room, and I wanted to be a part of it, and I just blurted out whatever I said, and it was the first time in my life that I ever said a swear. And as a sophomore in high school, I don't know if that's normal now or not, but I felt super uncomfortable the rest of the day. I kept replaying in my head like what I had said, why did I say it, but also like, did it sound cool? Do people like me? I just had all these like feelings of fitting in. So towards the end of the hockey season, sophomore year in high school, I was um, still had never drank, never smoked weed, nothing like that. And um, I got asked to go out with some kids on the hockey team, just like some older kids, they were seniors. So them being seniors, me being a sophomore, um, of course I wanted to go, I wanted to feel like I was part of it. And I actually, it's, it's so stupid, but I actually, as a sophomore in high school, I still had my D.A.R.E. certificate hanging in my bedroom. So if anyone doesn't know what D.A.R.E. is, D.A.R.E. was like a program um, they don't have it anymore, but it was a program to keep kids off drugs. And the big slogan for D.A.R.E. was like, just say no. And when you graduated this D.A.R.E. program, because like every kid did it in middle school, and it was like, just say no to drugs, and it was pretty simple and like nothing crazy, but they gave you a certificate. And it was like signed by a police officer, and you signed it and said like that you would just say no to drugs. I didn't like mean to still have it hanging on my wall as a sophomore in high school, but I did. It was hanging there saying that I would just say no to drugs. And I wasn't like preachy about like not using drugs. I just didn't know anyone that drank or smoked weed. I didn't um, want to be a part of it. I just thought that people that did that were different. And I uh, had them in like this different category and they weren't like kids that I knew. So that night that I was going out to a party like for the first time, I actually practiced how to say no in a cool way in front of my mirror in the bathroom. Like literally standing there practicing how to say no. So I get to the party and um, all the seniors from the hockey team are there and other seniors, it's kind of a big party. And uh, as soon as I get there, this senior, and I'm still a sophomore, says, hey, you want a beer? And like before he even finished the sentence, I was like, yep. And it was kind of like this whole, my whole life had led up to this one moment. This one moment to like stand up for what I believe in, to practice what I preach in a way like I had practiced saying no. He says, want a beer? And I'm like, yep. And there I am drinking a beer for the first time and um, not wanting to but thinking that the consequences of saying no were worse because I really cared about what other people thought. So I actually go sometimes and speak to middle school kids. So it's kind of funny when you, when you say that to middle school kids, they don't wait till the end to ask questions. They're like raising their hand and they're like, um, why didn't you just say no? And it's kind of like, listen, you're in middle school. You don't get it. Like you don't get what it's like in high school to have to like, stand in front of your friends and like make a choice and like stay true to yourself. It's not easy. Um, but that would be like the biggest piece of advice that I could ever give to someone is like, stay true to yourself, be your own person and like do what you want, not what other people expect of you. So uh, another middle school kid would say like, well, why didn't you just go not go to the party? And it's like, yeah, you're right. That probably would have worked too. And um, how cool would it be to like, have the attitude of a middle school kid forever and like not care what anyone thinks and just make your own decisions. But um, I think sometimes that's not realistic. So there I was my first time ever drinking a beer. That same night, those same older kids were smoking weed. And um, for me, instead of me thinking like, whoa, I can't believe those kids are smoking weed. I'm never gonna talk to them again. I kind of thought like, oh wow, they smoke weed? Maybe it's not so bad. And actually, I always usually say this when there's a big crowd, but like, I'm hoping everyone still calls it weed. 
because I don't want to sound like I'm like super old or anything, but um, I'm pretty sure everyone still says smoke weed, right, Drew? Yeah, cool. All right, so I, um, that same night, they offered it to me. They said, hey, you want some? And I'm like, you know, acting like I've done it before. Like, oh yeah, of course. So my first time going out, I drank and I smoked weed, sophomore year in high school, when I didn't want to. And um, it was kind of crazy, but I had a good night. Like, I liked the way it made me feel. I didn't get arrested. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't, um, you know, get in trouble with my parents. I didn't throw up. I didn't get sick. It was kind of like nothing bad happened. So there was nothing to stop me from doing it again. So I did it again the next weekend and the next weekend. And like, you know, the following weeks in school, like seniors were talking to me in the hallway. And I was thinking like, oh, all right, I'm fitting in. I felt like I was part of something. And maybe subconsciously I thought drinking and smoking weed had something to do with that, which now I know it doesn't. But, um, but that's what I thought then, so I just kept doing it. And every weekend I'd go out and drink and smoke weed. And like nothing crazy out of the ordinary from what I think goes on in high school. I don't think it was like red flags of like, oh, this kid's out of control or anything. I just was going and hanging out with friends. It didn't seem crazy to me. Um, so fast forward a little bit, coming from like a kid who had said his first swear sophomore year in high school, by my senior year, um, I was smoking weed every day. And um, you know, not like, it, it was just like always with friends. So part of my like progression was that I never thought it was too bad because I was always doing it with other people. So there's definitely something about like a comfort zone, right? And especially growing up in North Andover, I was always pretty comfortable. We were never like under bridges, you know? Like we were never like hanging out with homeless people. We were never like, you know, in a bad part of town. We were always like driving around in nice cars, hanging out at nice houses, and basically always with good people. So like it always felt comfortable. I never felt like what I was doing was wrong. So I would meet up with some friends before school, senior year. We would get high before school, go to school, skip study hall, leave school, smoke weed, and smoke weed after school. Um, it didn't feel like it was wrong. It just felt like something that I was doing with friends and it was like a social thing and I always felt comfortable. Um, I never drank during the week. So I wasn't like, you know, red flag, uh, this kid's gonna become an alcoholic. I drank on the weekends. I drank with my friends. I, I, um, we planned parties all throughout the week and on the weekend we would go and drink. And um, I didn't think that was too bad. I never had like a water bottle filled with vodka in my locker. I never um, went home and drank by myself in my bedroom. Like it was always social, always comfortable and never had like that bad feeling like what I was doing was wrong. So, um, so I kept doing it. And um, bad things did start to happen. And definitely there should have been some red flags. Like the way that I drank when I would go out and party would be like, I'm drinking as much as I can, as fast as I can, for as long as I can. And like, I had a curfew senior year in high school, like not a lot of other kids did. Um, and I think that gives you an idea of like how I grew up. I like, I had rules, I had like, but I was really good at lying to my parents about who I was hanging out with. Um, if I ever did get caught doing anything, I was really good at like blaming someone else. I always had like that one friend that I would blame everything on and like my parents hated him, but uh, and he never did anything wrong, but like I just would always blame him and my parents would believe me. I was good at lying. Um, so my high school time was fun. It wasn't like, you know, like I said, it wasn't red flags, like possibly I would be addicted to heroin someday. Um, so I graduated high school, um, I went to college. Um, I ended up going and visiting all my friends at different schools as well. So. Um, it was in college that I got introduced the first time to other drugs besides drinking or smoking weed. Um, and I think having drank and smoked weed the way that I did, 
it made it much easier to say yes to the next thing. Because the next thing wasn't a needle filled with heroin. The next thing was just a prescription pill that came out of a prescription pill bottle. And it was actually at a college um, with Division I hockey players. So I didn't play hockey in college, but my friends did. And um, I had friends that went and played Division I college hockey. And I was at the hockey house at one of those schools and Division I athletes, like, I can't stress that enough. The comfort zone there is huge. These kids, some of them were getting drafted and going and playing in the NHL and like, you know, they're, they're living this life of like, you know, future hockey players and I'm thinking like, how could what they're doing be wrong? And I always felt safe and comfortable. So when I went to this party and one of those hockey players pulled out a prescription pill bottle, that also felt safe. Something about like the prescription pill bottle was like, oh, that really did come from a doctor. It wasn't like it was a baggie full of pills because for me, that was my next step, right? I drank and I smoked weed. My next step was taking a pill. Had that pill been in a baggie full of pills, I really don't know if I would have done it. I'm not sure. But being in a prescription pill bottle, being in the environment that I was in, it was like the perfect storm. It felt super safe. So I tried it. Um, that pill was a Percocet and um, I liked the way it made me feel. Again, nothing bad happened. I didn't get sick. I didn't get arrested. I didn't get in trouble. I just kind of like had a good night. So I did it again the next weekend and the next weekend and the next weekend and still I only partied on the weekends. And in college, I don't think that's too crazy. Um, but I was taking pills and drinking and smoking and that's a little bit crazy. Like a lot of people in college go out and drink and there's definitely some normalcy to that. But when you start taking pills, when you start smoking weed a lot, there definitely should be some red flags. So for me, there were no red flags and there were no warning signs because so many other people around me were doing it. And I was able to look at those other people which I think you do sometimes without even knowing it, you kind of like compare yourself to other people. And like if you do something wrong, you might look at someone else and be like, well, I did this, but what they did was worse. You just make yourself feel a little bit better. So for me, I used to look at other kids that were taking those same pills and they were crushing them up and sniffing them. So I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. Like I even said like, I would never do that. So. I started building a tolerance to the Percocets. Um, I started always being able to look around a room, find people that were worse than me. I felt like I was fairly normal. Um, and I started building a tolerance. So you guys probably learned about tolerance at some point in school where that one pill, the next time I took one pill, didn't feel the same. I didn't get the same high. So I took like one and a half pills or two pills. So by the time I was taking like two or three pills at a time, um, I got introduced to Oxycontin and you guys know what Oxycontin is. It's, um, it's a more powerful version of a Percocet. So when I was offered the Oxycontin, um, the person who offered it to me again was a super safe environment. It was safe people and it was a pill just like I had already been taking pills. So it wasn't like a huge step and they said actually it's more powerful so instead of taking three pills you could take like a half of one of these and it's the same thing and I was like oh that's cool I'm taking less so it was another small step it was just another small choice that led down a bad path but at the time I didn't feel like I was taking a big step I didn't feel like I was like going down the wrong path I thought I was just kind of like hanging out and like partying no big deal so I started taking Oxycontin again, like only on the weekends, um, not being addicted to them, uh, just using them to party and have fun. And if I didn't have them one weekend, it was totally fine. I wasn't like looking for Oxycontin. It was just kind of like, it was around. I liked the way it made me feel, so I used it. Um, and I started building a tolerance to that. And I started seeing more and more kids crushing up their pills and sniffing it. And I still would look at them like, well, they're way worse than me. I would never do that. But then 
once I built the tolerance and once I was taking like a pill and a half or two pills, somebody was like, dude, you could just like crush it up and sniff it and do much less. And I kind of thought like, yeah. And again, like the environment, I keep trying to hammer this home, but something about that safe environment made it seem okay. It wasn't like, and I, and I use this like with all due respect to any other person's lifestyle, like it wasn't like I was being offered to smoke crack from a homeless guy under a bridge. I was being offered to crush up a pill that I was already taking from a college athlete at a really good school in, in like a safe environment, you know? And I just felt like that made it worse. That made it like easier to keep going. You know, had I been under a bridge hanging out with homeless people, maybe I would have stopped. Maybe I would have been able to look around and say, this isn't right. Like, but when you're surrounded by people you know and everyone's having fun and you feel safe, there's really nothing to stop you from doing the next thing, except yourself. Except like looking at it as this is wrong, which I didn't. So I crushed up a pill and I sniffed it for the first time. Um, I started doing that on the weekends. I never took a pill like regularly again. I just crushed it up and sniffed it. Um, and I started building a tolerance. Now at that time in my life, I'm getting through college. Um, I went and got a job as a bouncer in Boston at some bar and I had such a good time. I mean, people were sniffing pills and drinking and smoking weed and I'm getting in fights and I thought it was the coolest job in the world. Um, but it was probably that next step of like heading down the bad path. Like now I wasn't as comfortable as I was before. I wasn't with my high school friends or kids that I met in college. It was more like, you know, bouncers at bars and bartenders and people who go to bars. It's just like, it was a different environment. Um, but by that time, um, I was sniffing more and more Oxycontin. I was becoming addicted. And what that does is cloud your judgment. It, it, they, they call it a spiritual loss of values when you start becoming addicted to drugs. So like that different environment and that uncomfortable feeling, when you're using drugs, you don't really feel it. So like I slowly crept into the wrong crowd, but I did it so slowly that I never noticed. Um, and also no one around me noticed. I think like I was really good at faking that everything was okay. Um, so as I was sniffing Oxycontin, nobody really knew I was doing it, except for a few friends that I did it with. Like my parents didn't know, my family didn't know, my real friends that didn't use drugs didn't know. And I kept it really well hidden because my life on the outside was fairly normal. I had two jobs. Um, I went to school, I had an apartment, I had a car, um, I went to the gym after work. I did all things that like people do when they're living a regular life, except I was sniffing Oxycontin all the time. And I think that's something that whenever I go and speak to like a family, so, so a family will reach out to me and, and, and they might think that their kid's on drugs. And a lot of times they'll say like, yeah, but you know, I don't think he is because he, um, or she is uh, still going to work and still doing this and still doing that, like things that like normal people do, right? But that doesn't mean anything. I, w I was living a life that was, you know, multiple jobs and, and activities and going on dates and going to the gym and using drugs the whole time. It just becomes a part of who you are and you become better and better at lying to people about it. So I didn't have anyone else to stop me. So that's another thing, like if you're listening to this and you're thinking that will never happen to me, it might not, but it might happen to somebody you know. And it might take you looking at that other person and noticing and like bringing it to them and saying like, hey, I noticed something's going on. Maybe you should stop doing it or maybe you should look in the mirror or whatever. But sometimes it takes other people, but I didn't have that either. So I kept going and it kept getting worse and worse. So I remember when I was using Oxycontin a lot, sniffing it a lot, um, that time it was like, I don't know, it was like early 2000s, right? It was like 2005 or something like that. And there was a huge Oxycontin problem and it was, uh, they were calling it the Oxycontin epidemic. 
in the North Shore specifically, around here really, like, uh, but more like around Danvers and Peabody and Saugus, like those areas, it was a huge problem. So I remember there was this one week where there was a big news special and it was, um, it was either like 60 Minutes or Chronicle or something like that, like a news special. They advertised it all week long. The Oxycontin epidemic in the North Shore. And I remember watching the previews, thinking nothing of it. I remember watching the actual news special when it came on. I sniffed Oxycontin. I sat down and I watched a news special about how kids are getting addicted to Oxycontin and they're switching to heroin and becoming heroin addicts. And I watched this entire hour long news special and I said, that'll never happen to me. As I was high on Oxycontin at the time, and that's how drugs cloud your judgment. They cloud the way you view things. They cloud the way you view yourself. I looked at that and said like, I'm not like those people. I'm completely different. First of all, they never mentioned North Andover on that whole news special. And I live in North Andover, so like that could never happen to me. And they're talking about kids using heroin. And when they talk about heroin, they were showing like spoons and needles and lighters and like a life that I, I know nothing about. And I thought like, I would never do that. So that's how it ended. I said, that'll never happen to me. Instead of thinking like, maybe I should stop sniffing Oxycontin. So then not too long after that, I got introduced to heroin. And the way I got introduced to heroin was um, by this person who wasn't super uncomfortable feeling, but not the most comfortable. But again, when I'm using drugs every day, um, feelings and emotions kind of get pushed down. A lot of times you hear about people using drugs to like, to mask your emotions, to like not have to worry about anything, just keep using drugs. And, and that's true. You don't really have responsibility or feelings or like, you just don't know what's going on around you. So when I got introduced to heroin, um, I was sniffing an Oxycontin and I was building a tolerance. So I was sniffing a lot of Oxycontin and somebody else was sniffing heroin. And I was like blown away. I had no idea you could sniff heroin. So like, I thought you had to use needles and lighters and spoons and like tie something around your arm. Like you could sniff heroin and it was way cheaper and it was more powerful and you could use less. And it was like all very appealing because at the time I was also physically addicted. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the physical addiction in a minute, but, um, so instead of sniffing Oxycontin and at the time I probably still sniffed the Oxycontin, but I tried heroin for the first time. I sniffed it and again, just like everything else on my path, it was such a small step, right? The, the sniffing, it was just a different color powder. So like, I wasn't like, you know, trying a beer once in high school and then trying to shoot heroin. It was such a slow progression of small choices that led to like sniffing heroin. And once I did, I never used Oxycontin again. I sniffed heroin every day for like close to two years and um, nobody knew. And that was like the crazy part. I hit it so well that it was just like part of my life. It was just like part of who I was. And I pictured like never not doing it because I didn't think it was wrong. I didn't think what I was doing was bad. I wasn't getting arrested. I wasn't getting in trouble. Like nothing bad was happening, but I was building a tolerance to the heroin. So I was sniffing more and more, having to buy more and more, and um, something I said I would never do, and, and, and you know, to this day, I still can't believe I did, but that's when I got introduced to needles. And it was such a crazy, you know, if I look at it now, it gives me a pit in my stomach because it's like, how uncomfortable was that situation? compared to like the first time I had a beer at a high school party with like everyone I felt comfortable with. This was like, I was in someone's house that I didn't know and I was with someone I didn't know and the only like I guess good thing about it was like they had like brand new clean needles and they were like, hey, um, you really should try it this way. It's way better, it hits you faster, you can use less and it's more powerful and I'm thinking like, I'm pretty addicted to heroin. I'm sniffing it all the time. 
I'm not feeling the same high that I felt. You guys have ever heard the term like chasing a high? That's what I was doing. You're ch that. So for me, we, I was in this room and it was just kind of like uncomfortable. I didn't know how to do it. And the guy, the other kid's like, oh dude, I'll do it for you. So I let him put heroin in a needle. I stuck out my arm and I totally looked the other way and closed my eyes and let somebody shoot me up with heroin. And like saying that out loud, remembering that memory is crazy. For a kid who never said a swear until my sophomore year in high school, to sticking my arm out at 25 years old and letting someone shoot me up with heroin is insane. Um, but there is a level of insanity to drug addiction. And um, I was in it. I was addicted to heroin and I stuck my arm out and I let somebody shoot me up. So um, from then on, I never sniffed heroin again. I just started shooting up with needles every day, multiple times a day. And that is when I started noticing that my life was getting out of control because it was. And, um, and I know everybody's thinking like, dude, your life was out of control for a while with sniffing heroin every day. But like, for me, I didn't see it. I didn't see it until other people started seeing it because people started asking like, hey dude, what's with those marks on your arm? Or like, wow, dude, you look really skinny. You know, stuff like that. Just things that like people notice about people who are on drugs. And I had an answer for everything. But now I realize nobody believed me anymore. No one believed the lies that I had anymore. No one believed that I like, was this good kid anymore because I looked completely different. So um, I did the only logical thing when everyone found out that I was on heroin, my parents found out, my friends found out, like, and people were like all over me, like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Let us help you, like, what can we do? And I did the only logical thing, which was to run away. Instead of facing my problem head on, admitting that I had a problem and saying like, I'll fix it, I ran away from it. I left my apartment, um, I went and stayed with someone else, I didn't tell anybody where I was, and I continued to shoot heroin. And there definitely was a moment when I wanted to stop. And it was like, I, I should quit, I should stop, but it's really not that easy. And I think a lot of times, like, part of the definition of addiction is, it's a, it's a long definition, but part of it is like, to continue to use despite negative consequences. So I had all these negative consequences in my life, but I'm continuing to use. That's part of the definition of addiction. So like, there definitely are moments of clarity, right? And there definitely are moments where you think like, wow, what am I doing? Especially like when my parents are calling all the time and friends are calling like, please tell us where you are. Oh my God, it's so glad to hear you're okay. And thinking like, all right, this is pretty bad. So deciding to quit, and, and, and again, like a lot of people sometimes look at people that have negative consequences in their life that are, that are using drugs and they think like, why don't they just stop? It's really not that easy. And it's, it's, it's so hard. It's, it's, um, I'm trying to like find the words to describe it, but uh, it's an uphill battle. It's like climbing a mountain, getting a couple steps and sliding back like 20 feet every time. So like for me, it was an everyday struggle for months to try to quit. And it would go like this. I would wake up in the morning and I would be going through withdrawals. So you guys learned about withdrawals. It's like being dope sick or, or um, just not having opiates because for physical addiction, when you're taking artificial opiates, your body stops producing natural opiates. And when you don't have the artificial ones anymore, you start to become really sick. And um, the sickness feels like, it feels like food poisoning almost to where like you're throwing up, but like you also have like cold sweats and chills, but you're sweating and like this tingly, muscly feeling that's just like, it's a gross feeling. And it doesn't just go away. The only thing that makes it go away are more opiates. And, and that's why it's so hard for people to quit 
Um, and that's why they came out with drugs that help people quit, like Suboxone and Methadone. These kind of drugs like have a small amount of opiates just to get people through the withdrawal process without being sick. So for me, I would wake up every morning going through withdrawals, feeling sick, and shooting up. It's the only thing that would make me feel better. So I would load a needle with heroin, shoot heroin, feel a hundred times better and think, okay, I quit. And to the point where sometimes I would quit, like delete drug dealers numbers from my phone. Like I quit, flush heroin down the toilet. Like, okay, that's it, I quit. I'm done, that was my last time using. Cause I would feel good. I wasn't sick, I felt like, okay, I can like tackle this problem, I'm all done. And then later on that day, literally try to rip the toilet off the wall to get to the heroin that I flushed, even though I know it doesn't work that way. Like, but it's just this crazy cycle of withdrawals and chemicals in your brain that are so messed up that you're going through these spikes of depression and anger and like you don't know how to deal with it. So you just use again and it makes you feel better. So I kept doing that and doing that and I had this like, you know, big period of time of people calling and trying to help and, and just pretty bad, right? But I had this one friend, this friend is like, he's still my best friend today, but he was that kind of friend who basically researches everything. Like just an example, like he bought a TV a couple years ago and it took him about six months to research like the best TV. Everyone has a friend like that or you are that person. But like you research everything before you make a decision and um, it's probably a great way to do it. So for him, he researched addiction and then reached out to me and he like talked to people at rehabs and detoxes and like he learned a ton about addiction. He called me and said, hey dude, let me lay out the process for you. You need to go to a detox. You're gonna go through withdrawals, you're gonna be really sick. I have a place, there's a guy waiting, I can get you in and you can, you can get off heroin without being sick. Then you go to rehab. He's like, I got another guy, he's waiting, they have a bed for you. You go to rehab and they'll teach you how to live your life without using drugs. And he laid out this whole recovery process, everything he had researched and he said, tell me where you are, I'll come pick you up and I'll pay for everything. And he had it all set up. And for me, I had already done my morning routine of shooting heroin and quitting. So I was like, oh dude, I'm all set. I don't need any of that recovery process or detox or rehab. I'm just gonna quit and I'm done already. I'm all set, but thank you. And I like completely blew off my best friend. And um, the next day, the very next day, he had to see me on the front page of every newspaper and on the news because I got arrested for a bank robbery. And that's where my addiction took me. It took me from never saying a swear until sophomore year in high school, to sticking my arm out and letting somebody shoot me up, to trying to rob a bank just to keep my addiction going. And like that's the craziness that comes with, with drug addiction. I really thought it was an awesome idea. I thought like, wait a minute. If I rob a bank and get a ton of money, I can just buy a ton of heroin and only use a little bit every day to not be sick and I can just be normal again. That was like my real plan and I thought it was the best plan in the world. But instead I got arrested. Um, that was my first time in my whole life being arrested. Um, so I was in the back of a police car and, and um, went to the jail and they gave me one phone call and I called my parents who um, had been calling me every day and I kept telling them to leave me alone but when I was really down and out I called my parents and they weren't home and um, that was my one phone call so I left a message and I just said hey mom and dad um, I got in some trouble um, I'm at the police department like I didn't really say what happened and um, a police officer came back to the cell not too long after and he said um, hey uh, your mom just called and I remember thinking like, all right, everything's gonna be fine. Um, my parents are gonna come pick me up. These police officers know that I'm not like a career criminal. I've only been arrested once. I grew up in a good town. Like everything's gonna be fine. I felt this huge relief. 
And the police officer said, uh, don't worry, we told her you're being held with no bail for a bank robbery. And I thought like, no bail? I didn't really understand what that meant. So no bail, for anyone who doesn't know, and I, I know now, but I didn't realize the extent of it. They took me from the police department. They took me back in a police car. They drove me to Middleton House of Correction with um, barbed wire fences and canine dogs and like an orange jumpsuit, like no bail. And my first time ever being arrested, I had to spend a month there um, with no bail. Um, and it's there that I went through withdrawals. So I didn't get to go to detox. I had to quit heroin, basically cold turkey, which was lying on a, on a jail cell floor, like throwing up for three days, like no sleep, no eating, just like completely sick for three days. The worst experience ever which turned out to be the best experience ever um, because uh, I never used again since and I'm really grateful for that time that I had, those first 30 days. Um, so I ended up, this is where my story kind of just um, gets into my life today and it, and it was a long road still but um, after 30 days I was granted a bail and I was granted a bail on the condition that I go to rehab. So for me, going to rehab was, um, it was the only option to get out of jail, but I didn't think I needed it. So the judge said, okay, I'll grant you a bail and uh, on the condition that you go to this rehab. And so I did, I got out of jail, I went to rehab. I stayed in the rehab for 11 months. That's where I learned how to live my life without using drugs. That's where I learned that there's a huge difference between not using drugs and being in recovery. And today I live my life in recovery. Um, I try to be the best version of myself every day. I learned that in rehab. Um, it took a while for it to kick in, because I think a lot of times, like especially when you're younger, you think you have everything figured out. And for me, I definitely thought I had everything figured out. But luckily my lawyer said, stay in this rehab or you have to go back to jail. So I did. And I stayed long enough to like hear things that made sense. Um, and I live my life today the same way I did then. Um, so I ended up celebrating one year clean and sober. Um, that one year clean and sober was in rehab for between the jail and the rehab. Um, and then I went back to court for the bank robbery. Um, I had been going to court the whole time and I went in front of the judge and the judge kind of like laid out everything good about me and my life. And he said about how I grew up in a good town and a good family and how like full circle, you know, doing the right thing in rehab and being clean and sober for a year and like making one mistake, only being arrested one time in my life and like all that stuff. And he said, but you robbed a bank and there has to be consequences. So he sentenced me to two and a half years, uh, sorry, three and a half years in jail and five years probation after that. So with a year clean and sober, I had to go back to jail for three and a half years. Um, that time was pretty crazy for me. Um, I had my head on straight. I knew what I wanted. And um, a quick story about, and I'm gonna leave time for you guys to have questions at the end. Um, but when I got to jail, my first day, um, I was walking in and you're, you're walking into jail and you're carrying all your stuff and um, this, this certain jail block that I was going on was a recovery unit. So it was people with like drug charges, like whether they're drug dealers or drug users, but you know, drug charges. So they were doing this big meeting at the end of every day where everyone kind of just like, you know, comes out of their cells or whatever. So anyway, you, you walk in with all your stuff and like everyone's staring at you and I just kind of said like, Hey, I've been clean and sober for a year and I don't want to be around any negative people. And I said this in jail my first day. Jail is like the most negative place in the world, by the way. And, uh, and I'm a kid from North Andover, which I was like the only one. And I said, uh, I only want to be around positive people that want to change their life. I said, so I'm going to start a recovery Bible study. Anyone who wants to join, come see me. It was my first day in jail. And um, it made things pretty hard for me um, because no one likes when you do something like that. But for me, 
That was the first time in my life that I stood up for something that I believed in. That was the first time in my life that I walked into a room and didn't care what anyone thought. I was gonna do the right thing no matter what and no matter who was looking. And that's how I live my life today. Um, so that Bible study did get started and I became a super well-respected person in jail because, not because of being like a big tough guy and beating everybody up, but like because I was a good person who did what I said I was gonna do. I said I didn't wanna be around negative people and I wasn't. I said I wanted to change my life and I did. And I ended up gaining a huge respect for that. Um, so I did my time. Um, it's with parole and good time. I served like, you know, two and a half years around there. And um, I got out. Um, I was able to get released on an ankle bracelet. And um, I was walking to work one day. And um, let me back up a little because I, I was walking to work one day and um, bumped into my now wife. Uh, and I had an ankle bracelet on and everything, but my wife, um, I'm married by the way, I have two daughters, um, clean and sober for coming up on 13 years. Um, but my wife is my favorite part of my story because it's, it's a story of hope. Because making all the bad choices that I made and all the bad things that happened from it and all the bad things that are still going on, like like being a convicted felon for the rest of my life, that doesn't go away. Um, putting people's lives in danger that day in a, during a bank robbery, that doesn't go away. But you don't have to like live in the past. You can be the best version of yourself moving forward. Don't let a decision, a bad thing that happens to you define you. You, you make your own future. So um, for me, um, when I was growing up in North Andover, I just had like, I was super shy. Like again, I never swore. I just like always was worried about what people thought. But I had a crush on this girl in first grade, okay? And we went all through middle school together, all through high school together. We graduated together. And um, I was so in love with this girl that through 12 years of school together, I never talked to her once. And it's not like North Andover is a big town. Like everyone knew who everyone was, but I never talked to her once, not one word. Um, and that's my wife today. Um, I really got to marry the girl of my dreams. And it's because of the way I live my life today. And that's the girl that when I was walking from a bracelet house with an ankle bracelet on, coming out of jail, she just happened to be driving by and she pulled over and stopped and like, I basically confessed my love and like asked her out after telling her that I just got out of jail for a bank robbery and have an ankle bracelet and like I just spewed everything and um, asked her out on a date. She said no <laughs> and um, I just didn't give up. And um, my two daughters, my daughter Eva, she turned seven years old today. So we had an awesome morning birthday celebration. My daughter Audrey's turning four on Monday. Um, we have a house in North Andover in like an amazing neighborhood. Um, I'm grateful today for like the little things. Like I'm grateful to be able to like mow my lawn and like I'm grateful to be able to like use my brand of deodorant. Stupid little things that like when you go to jail and have your freedom taken away, you become grateful for, for other things. So um, my life today is beyond amazing. Um, Jenna and I, my wife, we were able to use our wedding as a giant fundraiser and we started a nonprofit that we have in Lawrence to help kids that didn't grow up like we did in North Andover and that have the odds stacked against them. Um, and again, like moving forward, you guys are all going off to college. This is a huge time to make the right choices and to know the ripple effect of your choices and how big it is. It spreads so far and so deep that it's hard to even comprehend how many people look to you, look up to you, worry about what you're doing, it, it's crazy. So um, make good choices, do the right thing. We're gonna get out of this quarantine and um, life's gonna be good again. But thank you guys so much for listening and uh, let's open it up for questions and guys really, Ask anything, 
anything you want and um, especially if you have anyone you know that's struggling or something like that, I'd love to try to help. All right, there we go. In just a second, guys, we're gonna open it up to questions, but I would, you know, virtually wanna say thank you to Anthony. Uh, he came here last year, uh, presented to the seniors uh, during the senior seminars, and I think he does a great job speaking to you guys about a really important topic, and that's about the power of your decisions. And even these little tiny decisions uh, can lead you in, in certain directions. Um, so please be aware of that. Um, little tiny bad decisions can lead you to a dark place, but at the same time, little tiny good decisions can lead you in a really positive direction. So we, won't, we want you to keep that in mind because remember, you are, you're leaving us, sadly. We're gonna miss you, we love you, we care about you, but we're not going to be able to watch you anymore, and you're you're going to be leaving your parents' house at some point. So that that level of support's going to be gone. It's it's really going to be up to you and your friends around you uh, to make sure that you guys are making decisions that are going to play out well for your life. Uh, so right now, I will unmute you if you want to ask any questions and hang out and um, you know hear from Anthony a little bit more. Uh, feel free to do so. And just before you ask a question, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, I don't know if you said anything about this, but uh, was there like a big drug culture at North Andover? That's a great question. Um, so there wasn't a huge drug culture in North Andover. There, were, there was a huge drinking culture, um, and especially among my friends. In fact, like as far as drugs go, I remember in high school, like there was a rumor one time that like a kid tried coke. And like no one even knew if it was true but like we didn't have other drugs we didn't have the opiates that you guys have like around the schools today like I go to some towns and the teachers pull me aside and say like you know a junior in high school a sophomore in high school has already been to rehab like we didn't have anything like that we had kids smoking weed we had kids drinking and you had the occasional like hippie crowd doing mushrooms or something like that other than that, there was not a huge drug culture at all. That's why like a prescription pill bottle was, was foreign to me, but it at least was like safe. It looked like something that was like, you know, real. That's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. No. Go ahead guys with the questions. You, um, really, you can ask anything. I'm, I'm only looking at my phone. I'm gonna try to find a picture of my family to show you. I hope I have one. Um, I have a question um, for Mr. Metagoni or Mr. Tracy. I'm not on the Google Classroom for the class of 2020. Is there any way you guys can send me <laughs> the link to that? Yeah, we, can, we, we will do that for you, Chris. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no worries. Good timing. That is good timing. <laughs> Anthony, I just wanted to pop in because I always have stuff to say. I'm Kristen Lazaro, the director of school counseling, yeah. and I really appreciate that you've kept, you've come back to us to share your story. Um, but I do want to say to the seniors of 2020 that we're always here for you. Um, there's plenty of people to help you out. So if you or somebody you know is struggling, I really encourage you to reach out to a school counselor, the nurse, one of the administrators, and that's like we're always here we're not going anywhere so next year the year after you feel like you need somebody please just reach out to us we are here for you i got another question absolutely where did you say uh you the college scene was that you went to that like had like a lot of or whatever yeah so um not to throw any college under the bus at all like and this was this was a long time ago but it was merrimack college Oh yeah. So there was there was a huge North Shore crowd that went to Merrimack College, like Saugus and Peabody, and and the OxyContin was huge there, and 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 the hockey players at the time were were using it, and it was it just felt comfortable and safe because it's a really good school, um, and I don't I, I doubt it's still like that. It just at the time it was bad everywhere, but that's where I where I spent most of my time. That's Thank a great you. question too. Yep. 
Guys, my wife has all the pictures on her phone. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm so bad about it. Anthony, what, uh, what steps do you think students should take if they suspect there's an issue with one of their friends or with somebody in their family? So the great thing um, that you can do for someone who, who, who's struggling um, is think about part, part of my story, right? Think about the part of my story where I didn't really know that it was bad, right? And I was living, when I was like using all the time and not caring about emotions and feelings and responsibilities, I was totally living in a fantasy world. And that's what drug addiction's like. You're living in this like bubble where you don't know what it looks like from the outside because you can't see it. You don't know how it feels because like you're, you're killing all your feelings and emotions. So I always like to say, sometimes you need reality to crash down. And that's what you can do for someone. And it's not hurting them, it's helping them. Bring reality to them and show them what it looks like from the outside. And like, you know, don't stop. When they say like, no, leave me alone and, and, and I don't want help, don't stop because they don't mean that. Um, so um, that's a huge, huge thing you could do for them is bring reality crashing down, especially with the people around them, parents, teachers, um, counselors, like, you need, it, it does take a village sometimes. You gotta get people involved and, and crash reality down on the person to know like, this isn't okay. And never, and I mean never, like never in the history of the world does drug addiction without getting clean and sober end well. It doesn't. You don't just keep using drugs your whole life and have a great life. There's even like celebrities who you think have everything in the world, money, fame, like cars, girls, guys, whatever, like, and they like commit suicide because they're, they're in the depths of addiction. It's such a bad thing, it never ends well. Um, it can change, and like my life is amazing now, but my addiction didn't end well. I got arrested for a bank robbery and like went to jail for a pretty long time. Um, so it never ends well, and they, they need to know that. That's a great question. Guys, I'd love to just show a quick family picture, um, and I hope you can see it. It's kind of like screen on a screen, but that was my daughter's, um, can you guys see that? That was a, my daughter's um, virtual recital the other day for her dance class, but um, that's my wife and my two daughters. I don't usually in a presentation get to show everyone that, but um, since it was a screen, that worked out good. Any more questions, guys? Um, I have one. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering if like, there's ever a point where like, you knew what you were doing was wrong or like you felt like that guilt or like, and how you like dealt with that if you ever did. For sure, so it wasn't until the end. It wasn't until those days struggling trying to quit that I felt that guilt and knew that it was wrong. Um, and at that time, you're so deep in addiction that it's almost too late, right? You're so like, it, it just was such a, um, such a vicious cycle that by the time I felt guilty about it, I just used again. And then you wouldn't feel it anymore. And it just was like this crazy, but then um, there is a ton of guilt and shame and like, you know, rehab to do when you get clean. And um, it's kind of a crazy thing, but like when you're using drugs, the chemicals in your brain are like going crazy, right? And when you get clean and sober, it takes about a year for those chemicals in your brain to like be regular again. So my first year of sobriety was like kind of crazy. You're dealing with all these emotions without drugs and just yourself. So like there's a lot of crying, there's a lot of like mood swings, it's kind of crazy, but that guilt really sets in. And part of just not using drugs or being in recovery, part of being in recovery teaches you how to deal with that guilt and to not like harp on it and feel bad because some people 
they just like really like focus on the guilt and oh, I feel so bad and then they use again. So you just have to really like, don't forget the past but move on from it. It's, it's, a, it's a really hard process and not a lot of people are successful in recovery. Um, but when you are, your life can be unbelievable. Do you believe that uh, marijuana is a gateway drug? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a quick story. So my short answer is yes, right? But it's more complicated than that. I don't think that like every kid that tried weed in high school becomes a drug addict. Um, but I just remember one time I went and spoke at a school and um, my wife stays home with the kids now but she was a teacher before and one of her people that she taught with, their kid was in the school that I went and spoke at and uh, the teacher told my wife, um, yeah my son thought your presentation was really good but he stopped listening after you said weed was a gateway drug and I thought like alright so I should stop saying that because it is kind of a turn off right? Because it isn't necessarily, I think what it is for, for me was smoking weed made it easier to take the next step, right? Had I never smoked weed, I probably would have never tried a pill just because it wasn't like in the realm of like the way I partied. So when you party by like, you know, smoking so much weed that you're like high out of your mind, trying something else is like not that far fetched. But if you've only ever had like one or two beers in your life and never smoked weed, would you really try that next step? I'm not sure. So not really a gateway in a sense where like by smoking weed, it makes you want to try something else. I think it just makes it a little bit easier. And I hope that, that that's a good answer because I don't, wanna, I don't want you to get turned off thinking that I think every kid that smokes weed is going to become a drug addict. But if there is a slight chance, is it worth it? Like, I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions, by the way. Thank you. Guys, one more family picture. Sorry, my wife's texting them to me as we do this. That's just us on a little vacation. Um, I think I'm wearing the same shirt, that's weird, as with the other picture. Uh, but those are, those are my two daughters, Eva and Audrey, and like, it's, that's part of my gratitude is, is having them be able to look up to me and like being there for them. They never know me as the old person who used to use drugs, like I'm so far removed from that. It's pretty cool, it's an amazing life. Anything else, guys? The last kid who asked a question is frozen on my screen with like a weird face. I'm frozen right now? You were frozen right, on my, back. now you're back. You're back. <laughs> my back hurts from carrying all these questions. <laughs> I, dude, you're carrying the whole class. I know, I'm, yeah, I know, it's weak. <laughs> Someone else going, but. Right, but I have a quick question. We're both hockey guys. Oh, there's a yeah. question, here comes a question. Um, how, like, I get that you went to prison for a bank robbery, but how would you say to prevent someone from getting to that point where life hits them that hard? Because obviously no one wants to go through that, but if they are, say someone's go is an addict, but you don't want to get to that point, how would you prevent someone from getting to that point? So that's a, that's a really tough question because everybody's different. And there's definitely a level to quitting that all comes down to the person. They have to be willing to stop. They have to know that where they're headed is where I was, but not to get that far. So sometimes people think everyone needs to hit rock bottom to get better. I don't believe that. I think you can look at it, have the right people around you, and have the willingness to like move forward and get better before anything bad happens. Like hear a story like this and say, you know what? I'm not gonna let myself go to jail before I get clean. I'm gonna get clean right now. And, um, and I know people can do it because you can do anything you put your mind to. 
Like, I really believe that. Like, I truly believe that however many people are on this Zoom right now, if we got together, we could change the world by making good choices, doing the right thing, helping others, and like slowly, that's how it works. I truly believe that someone can quit. Um, it's all about their willingness. So for you, again, it's bringing reality to that person. It's showing them what is gonna happen to you moving forward because it's inevitable. They say, and, and when I say they, being in recovery, there's a huge recovery like, you know, um, society, I guess, like where it's, it's people in recovery, we talk to each other, we know each other, and there are all kinds of different sayings. But there's a saying that says, addiction only ends three ways, jails, institutions, or death. Now, institutions would be like going to rehab or going to a detox because sometimes it takes that. It takes like going somewhere and getting help. Um, institutions also could be like a group of friends, like really helping someone, like, but it's something that helps you. It's like those are the three ends, jails, institutions, and death. And there's like um, in recovery circles, there's like these meetings like AA or Narcotics Anonymous. There's all different meetings. And one of them, they say that like out loud, they say like, and then everyone in the meeting kind of says it like, jails, institutions, and death, because it's true. Uh, because you've, I've seen so many people who have been clean and relapsed that are now dead or in jail or in rehab. It's like, those are the three ends. So if somebody knows that, and they have the right people around them, and they have the willingness, it doesn't have to get that far. Great question. Guys, I'll be honest. I'm hearing questions today that I've been doing this for, um, I don't know, 10 years now, and um, I haven't heard questions like this. Some of these are great. How long would you say, uh, like, like in the recovery time, like when was it like that period where like you were like, all right, like I need this and like you didn't feel addicted anymore? In the recovery period? Yeah. Yep, so, um, so it really does take a long time. So for the physical addiction, it's, um, it's three days of withdrawals and then you really are after the three days, like your body starts producing natural opiates, like you feel better. Um, but it's the mental, it's the chemicals in your brain. It takes about a year for those chemicals to regulate. So you'll still get cravings for up to a year after you're off drugs. Um, but as far as like physically needing them, it's only like, you know, probably a week of that physical, like I need it. But the emotional needing drugs is way more powerful because you're thinking that you need it. You can't like go talk to someone one-on-one. -on -one. You can't go like out in public without using, um, you know, you, you, something bad happens in your life. Like you lose a loved one, your dog dies, like something you feel like you need to use because you've never felt those emotions before. When you're on drugs, you feel like everything's just like pushed down and pushed down and you don't care about anything. When you're free of drugs, you just have yourself. So you need to learn how to like cope with things that happen and not turn back to drugs. That's the hardest part. Um, and that takes like over a year because your chemicals in your brain are just like crazy. There's a huge science to addiction. Um, it's not all like, and, and I, I'll use this like loosely, but it's not 100% the person's fault. When you look at someone that's like doing bad things and using drugs, like it is their fault and it's not. Addiction, there's a science to it. There's chemicals in your brain. There's the physical aspect. It's, it's tough. It's really hard. Another good question though. I have another question. Yes. <laughs> um, so I know like, like obviously you've beaten it and you've gotten over it, but there are so many people that don't. And I just like, I don't know. I guess the question is more just like, why are there so many people that aren't able to beat it? And like, if you know someone like that, how can you help them? And like, yeah. just like that whole, the yeah. struggle, I guess. For sure, it's a, it's a huge struggle and I try to help people all the time. And uh, to the point where I get aggravated a little bit, like I, I, I'm starting to lose a tolerance for, for someone continuing to like make mistakes and make mistakes like the same mistakes. Um, but it really is all down to the person after the physical part's over, it's all down to a willingness 
like a readiness, like are you ready to like get to the next level and like never use drugs again? That's why in recovery they say it's one day at a time. Because sometimes if you say to someone like, hey, you could never drink again. Because I don't drink again, but uh, I don't drink either, by the way. Um, and um, that's a question some people ask sometimes, but um, no alcohol, no drugs for um, coming up on 13 years, or maybe 14, but I think 13. But um, so um, for me, I remember early on in recovery, right? I was at the rehab and in this rehab, uh, there were a hundred guys. And every night there would be people from the recovery community that would come in and speak to us hundred guys. And I remember they used to say, at least once a week, someone used to say, there's a hundred guys in this room. Statistically, only one of you is gonna be clean and sober for the rest of your life. And like, I guess statistics show, like it is really that much. But every time I heard that, I always would say to myself, it's me. It has to be me. And it's not me because I'm better than anyone else. It's me because I'm willing to work harder. Um, it's what are you willing to do to stay clean and sober? And I'll always ask somebody that when they want help. Like, what are you willing to do? And they say like, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay clean and sober. Like, okay, because when you're using drugs, you're really willing to do whatever it takes to get drugs. So they say, if you use half the effort that you used to use to get high, to get clean, half the effort, you'll stay clean the rest of your life. That's how like, it really all comes down to the person. But it also takes the people around them. If you stay with them, supporting them, and, and, and being that person they can lean on, that helps a ton. It's too bad though, it's, it's, it's such a bad part of this, this world of recovery because so many people end up dying of overdose after they've been clean and sober for a period of time and there's so many people that never get it um, and just struggle the rest of their life, it's crazy. Guys, this is going really well, I feel like. I'm loving the Zoom interaction, I, I think it's cool. And my background is a gym because um, I thought like, who needs to see me sitting at my kitchen table doing this? So um, I talked to the director of youth services in North Andover and I said, hey, can I use your gym? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. So we're also filming it for future use. questions guys feel free to chime in um, we don't hear anything for just a little bit here we'll probably close things out No, I can. Um, sorry. Okay, uh, I've heard before that, especially with heroin, but with multiple drugs, that once you've used once, that it's kind of a lifetime of addiction. Would you say that that is it will be a lifetime struggle for you, or that you feel like you're completely cured? Okay, so um, so that's a really good question, and it's um, it's tough to answer because there's a huge argument still whether or not um, addiction is a disease that I have that some people might not. So just using heroin once doesn't mean that you're a drug addict. Um, like my wife smoked weed once in college and like didn't like it, never did it again. Like I smoked weed once sophomore year and like smoked so much weed that like, you know, like so it's just, it's different like that. But once you're an addict, you are always an addict. And, and the argument for, for addiction is a disease um, goes all the way to like, um, it's hereditary, it's in our, in, in our DNA, like it can be passed down. There's certain ways that your body metabolizes alcohol that can be passed down and like, if you have a history of drug addiction in your family, you are more susceptible to it. They're still trying to figure things out. Um, and I'm in, the, I'm in the school of thought that um, addiction is a disease 
that I carry. So that's with me forever. And, and again, about all the sayings people have, but some people say, if I was to pick up right now and use drugs again, you don't pick up where you left off. You pick up where you would have been had you been using the whole time. So like I would do heroin again and I would be like in jail in a day. Like it just, I'd be so out of control that it would be like crazy. Um, and I think again, there's a huge part of like between not using drugs and being in recovery because some people that just don't use drugs, they could be clean and sober for five years, just not using drugs, but they're right on the edge. They're like holding on, like struggling, like I'm never gonna do it, and, but still having cravings and not knowing how to deal with things. Like, but being in recovery, I'm so far removed from it that like, it's not even in my, you know, I would never do it. And, and, and same thing, like I would never, I would never take a drink, not because I was an alcoholic, um, but because I think it's very similar. But for me, it's more like, if there's a slight chance that I have a beer and 10 years from now, I'm down a path that I try another drug someday, it's probably not worth it. So like, I'm just not gonna have a beer. So I just don't drink or do drugs. But yeah, it's, it's um, that's a really good question. And I think scientists are still trying to figure that out. Like whether or not it, it's a disease or not. And I think, more than likely it is. Great question. Thank you. So Anthony, I think um, maybe at this point we'll probably close it out if that's okay. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for having me. and. Um, and we always like to say to um, all these um, administrators that are on the Zoom have my contact info. If anyone ever has like questions or anything, you could forward it through them and it will get to me. And um, we'd love to try to help you in any way with a friend that's struggling. If you're struggling, anything like that, um, there is a community here for you to help and, and, and they know how to do that. Great, so thanks again, everyone, uh, for hanging out this long. I, I hope that you, you found a powerful message here today and that you can carry this uh, forward with you as you move on in life. Um, you know, housekeeping, you know, you've got uh, a few days here to, to deal with some of the senior seminar things. Um, if you have any questions about that stuff, certainly you can email me and I'll try to help you out the best I can. Um, but we hope that you take a lot from these next few days because it's a chance for you to really think about uh, you know what living an independent life might start to look like a little bit because it is going to be a big transition um, even in the crazy times uh, that we're living right now so thanks again everyone um, and we'll see you in person hopefully next Friday um, and Anthony would you be able to either stay in the meeting or could I give you a call absolutely to follow up on this yep I'll stay I, I'll stay right here that's fine okay yep Congratulations, guys, too. Good luck in college if you're going or whatever you're doing. And um, seriously, congratulations. You guys, class of 2020 is like um, definitely some crazy memories for uh, to tell your kids someday. Dude. Thank you. I'll see you guys at a later Thank meeting you. today.